morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope Church. I am not Aaron Rowling, um, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, my name is Rick Spillers. I am I'm from Marlette. I grew up here, um, but I am the worship leader over at Flint City Church in Flint. Um, but Pastor Paul and Aaron are out of town this week, so they asked if I'd be willing to fill in and help out and lead worship today for them. And um, yeah, I love leading worship. So of course, I jumped at the opportunity. I actually uh, am having like flashbacks really bad in here because I remember when this used to be Huffman's and then uh, CeCe's and then uh, Stacks Cafe and then Hope Church originally. Um, and that's when I kind of left town. So um, it's, it's great to be back here with you all. Uh, I just want to open us up with a word of prayer and then we'll get started. So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just being with us today. There's a lot of craziness going on in the world and uh, that feels like you can't get away from it sometimes. But we know that when we come into your throne room, Lord, that there's peace and there's goodness and there's joy and we're just, we're so thankful for that. And so we want to worship you. We want to give you glory. We want to give you honor, Lord, because you're due and we understand. And so um, Jesus, take our worship today. Just let it bring joy to your ears. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. If you guys wouldn't mind standing up with us here, uh, we're going to sing some songs. I think some of them are new, but uh, the words should be up on the screen, and I challenge you to sing along with me, okay? One more 
time Cause I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free I'm free in you Amen, amen Man, that's awesome to sing out to the Lord. We know it's true, Jesus, that you set us free. And we give everything we have to you this morning, Lord. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Yes, we are, Lord. We're here for you, Jesus. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. Amen. We are here for you. To you, our hearts. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy, God. Let your fire fall down.
forever everlasting the all creating one God almighty through your Holy Spirit conceiving Christ the Son Jesus our Savior yes, I believe in I believe in Christ the Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, because our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Alright, our judge and our defender, let's sing it out to him. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Yes, it is, Lord. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Yes, you did forever. next song, I just challenge you all to just uh, sing it out with everything you got if you know the words. If you don't, that's okay. Just set your heart in a posture of worship this morning. Even though it's rainy and kind of dreary, God is good. He takes care of us. And even in the face of all the tough things we go through, Jesus is still there and he's still good. So I challenge you to just let him know this morning. Joy. 
more time, just the voices.
Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are and what you've done. God, we give you all the glory and the power and the credit that's due your name. Lord, we are nothing without you and we know it, Jesus. We ask that you would just fill this place with your spirit, Lord. Be with us as we hear your word spoken, the truth given, Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. You guys can greet a neighbor for a few minutes. Say hi to everybody if you haven't said hi yet, okay? If, uh, can you turn this up just a little bit, Jerry? Joe's having a hard time here in the second what? row. So. <laughs> All right, as many of you have seen, Pastor Paul and Pastor Aaron aren't here this morning. They are in Grand Rapids uh, ministering with uh, their two daughters. Liz plays the bass now. Isn't that exciting? With their two daughters and son-in-law. So it's an exciting day for them. Uh, so today we have uh, Joe Gildersleeve, right, uh, speaking today. Um, couple announcements I have here. Uh, if, if you're here for the first time, I hope you feel welcome. I uh, hope you've been greeted with a smile. Uh, men's retreat. There is a sign-up sheet on the coffee bar in the back. Uh, even if you've asked Pastor Paul about going and you mentioned you're going to go, make sure you sign up on the sheet so we have a list there. Others will walk up to the sheet, and if they only see one or two names, they'll think, oh, I'm going to be like the only one going. So make sure you put your names on that uh, 
That is uh, September the 16th and 17th, Friday and Saturday. If you feel you can't make it for both of those days, Friday night and Saturday, please come. Tell Pastor Paul, you know, I can only come for a few hours. Just don't stay home because uh, you're going to miss out on a lot of, a lot of neat things. Uh, the retreat costs $64 a person. Uh, this includes one night's lodging and four meals. Um, please make your checks payable to Momentum Christian Church with the men's retreat in the memo line. You don't want to miss this great time of fellowship, food, and activities and teaching. All right. And, bocce uh, ball. and, and what now? Bocce ball. Bocce ball. <laughs> <laughs> Very long tournaments of bocce ball. <laughs> Joe's quite excited about that. <laughs> Stay tuned for many things happening in September. We're going to have youth groups, small groups, midweek services, and many other things happening in September. So keep an eye on those announcements. With that, I'd just like to introduce you to Joe Gildersleeve. He moved up here in uh, June of last year uh, from Virginia to experience some Michigan winters. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. You clearly shouldn't clap yet. Um, so if you knew I was going to speak and you were here last time, thanks for staying. And um, uh, if you didn't know, then just trust that Pastor Paul will be back next week. Uh, before we get into the word, if you'd uh, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, approach your word with reverence. We ask, Father, that uh, your Holy Spirit would illuminate our hearts and minds to not only understand it academically, but to um, give us the fruit of the Spirit to incorporate what we hear today into our lives, that we can live it out so that you would be honored, you would be glorified, and we would be sanctified. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I should uh, tell you that the vast majority of this message is for disciples of Christ. Um, there are, we're going to go over a lot of scripture. I, I tend to put a lot of scripture into sermons because that way I don't make as much stuff up. And, and uh, there's a higher probability that it's all true then. Um, and I'll also say that I normally preach using the uh, New American Standard Bible and I'll be using the ESV here today, so if I don't say the same words that are on the screen, it's not because I can't read, it's because I'm pre-programmed a little bit with a slightly different version. Turns out they're both in English, and that's good. <laughs> so I, I mentioned that this, um, this is really for disciples of Christ, so if there are any here today or perhaps watching online that are not yet disciples in Christ, I want to um, just address that quickly couple famous verses in the Bible uh, that you've seen, no doubt, even if, even if you're not yet a believer, and that's uh, John 3.16. You've probably heard of that one. It's kind of one of the greatest hits. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. So that phrase, whoever believes in him, we just sang a song about that. Good pick, Ricky. That, uh, it's amazing how the Lord weaves those things together. Um, whoever believes in him is more than just um, an academic assent to the fact that there was this guy, Jesus, who was alive once upon a time, right? It, it goes way beyond that. Uh, lots of people believe that Jesus existed. Some of them even believe that he was a great prophet or a good teacher or a really good guy, and he even did some cool tricks. But this is way beyond that, right? Romans 10.9 gives us some more insight into that whole idea of belief. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Confession that Jesus is Lord is more than stringing together a series of sounds that comes out, Jesus is Lord, right? We could probably train a parrot to say Jesus is Lord. Confessing Jesus as Lord is way beyond just uttering the phonemes that make those sounds, right? Confessing means we're testifying that Jesus is Lord, and that word Lord has great meaning. 
Master, Messiah, Adonai. There's all kinds of titles ascribed to the Lord um, that give much deeper meaning than just saying he's a good teacher. It's way beyond that. The second part we also sang about, uh, if we believe in the resurrection, if you believe that God raised him from the dead, those promises are for you today if you haven't yet, or if you have, put your faith in Jesus Christ. If that's where you are today, today can be the day of salvation for you. Or if you're hearing this online in the future, whatever day you're hearing it, could be the day of salvation for you if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. The things that we're going to talk about uh, throughout this sermon are for disciples. Please don't think that if you're not yet a disciple and therefore not yet filled with the Holy Spirit that you can somehow do the stuff that we're going to talk about. In these commandments in the scripture from the Lord to us. But also trust that if you are a disciple, we know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So although some of the commandments in the word are not easy, right? Okay, they're impossible without the Lord giving us the ability. But we know that he doesn't command us to do things that he doesn't also enable us to carry out. Praise God for that. So we're going to start out um, in Matthew chapter 22. So this is often uh, nicknamed, if you will, the, the great commandment. So Jesus, uh, as background, Jesus has been talking with the Pharisees here, which he got along with famously, as I'm sure you know. And so he had been giving them divinely wise answers, and some of them were perceiving, hey, this, this guy has a clue. Um, of course, most of them wanted him gone and dead. But one of them, uh, who was a lawyer, not like a trial lawyer, uh, but rather an expert in the law, uh, said to him, uh, he, he asked uh, Jesus, what is the, the greatest uh, commandment? And Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the law and the prophets. Well, there you have it. Lo love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go and do that. See you next week. So I know we're going to talk about some, some aspects of living that out in our lives. Um, we're going to talk about our thought life and studying the word, uh, prayer, prayer, Worship, service, and fellowship. Just, a, just some easy stuff, right? So the importance of our thought life, our thoughts are often referred to in Scripture as our heart or our mind. In the Sermon on the Mount, in, uh, Matthew, uh, sorry, later uh, than that, Matthew chapter 15, just a few pages before what we just read, Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20, the Lord's explaining to us the importance of our thought lives <clears throat> for out of the heart come evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality theft false witness and slander these are what defile a person but to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile anyone so he answered that way because they said the people were asking why don't your disciples wash their hands before you eat it wasn't because they were afraid of germs right it was because of the ritual washing and the Old Testament that was prescribed, and he's like trying to help them understand that's not what defiles you, not keeping these minutia of the law. It's what's in your heart, because what's in your heart comes out in what you do, right? He listed a whole series of sinful actions, and then he listed some sinful words. Romans 8 6 helps us understand more about the mindset. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the, set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So the difference between life and death, literally, where is our mind focused? Well, we are charged in Romans 12, 2 to do something about what's going on in our noggins. Romans 12, 2 uh, tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We're to be transformed, changed from the inside out by renewing our mind. That takes effort. It, it won't happen by accident. We're going to talk about some of what it means to renew our mind. And some of that is exercising the fruit of the spirit of self-control over what we think about. When I uh, spoke before, I, I spoke on uh, Philippians chapter 4 in a few verses. I'm going to repeat them now because I think they're so critical to our Christian walk. In Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7. This is a tough command, but it's in the word. This is written in the imperative sense. So it's not a suggestion. And yet, without Christ, it's impossible to do. Do not be anxious about anything. That, that's what the word says. Don't, you know, don't be mad at me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Look, I know some of you right now are going through incredibly difficult circumstances. Some of you have been there in the past. And if you're not in one of those categories, it's almost certain that you will someday. And yet, the Lord tells us, don't be anxious about anything. That's really hard to do. And you probably know that depression and anxiety is a huge problem in the American church. No doubt in the church globally. And yet, with all the troubles that we have here in America, we are a blessed people. We are tremendously blessed. If you've had the chance to go anywhere else on the planet and seen what our brothers and sisters the conditions in which they live and you come home you go you know it ain't that bad and it's pretty good we get to have the bible you can buy them pertinent everywhere a lot of us have a whole bunch of these at home and our brothers and sisters around the planet may not even have but a scrap of scripture if that and if they get caught with it they might get locked up or worse so we are blessed And yet, as a people, as God's chosen people, anxiety is throughout uh, our churches, and we contrast that social reality with what the Word tells us. Be anxious for nothing. We have to, we have to accept that being anxious and worrying is actually sin. Because the Bible tells us don't do it. <laughs> if we excuse our anxiety, we won't overcome it. Because we won't confront the root cause of it, which is the sin of not trusting God. That's really what it comes down to. If we're worried about stuff, maybe we don't believe that God's as good as he says he is. And that he's not really got it, whatever it is. You know, I think just last week, Aaron was talking about laying concerns before the Lord. And then like, okay, uh, it's, it's been like an hour. You haven't fixed it. I'm going to pick that back up and worry about it some more. Or maybe you're good and you like leave it there for a few days or weeks and then say, he hasn't done anything yet. Maybe, maybe I need to, you know, fuss about that some. Yeah, that's not, that's not the model, is it? We need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and he'll take care of stuff. 2 Corinthians 10.5 gives us some more insight into this whole notion of um, helping with our thought lives. It says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The, the idea of taking thoughts captive in obedience to Christ means we need to self-assess what's going on in our minds. We need, to, we need to be active about it. I also mentioned Philippians 4, 8 last time. Uh, this was a, a powerful verse. <laughs> the 
they all are, but in my own um, dealings with the importance of our thought life. And Philippians 4, 8 tells us, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The New American Standard lists true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent, and praiseworthy. Dwell on these things. So dwell means keep thinking about them. If you take those words, this is part of my military mindset, I guess. We make acronyms out of everything. Uh, if you take true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellent, and praiseworthy, take the first letters, it spells thurple grip. So if our thoughts are thurple grip, then we're supposed to dwell on them. If it's not, we're not supposed to. So when we take thoughts captive in obedience to Christ, we need to assess, is this thurple grip? I hope they can show this picture that uh, kind of occurred to me some time ago that this kind of captures a little bit of this concept and what we read in Romans 8, 6, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts and evil deeds and evil words, right? And so we are all subject to impulses or triggers, something that maybe you see on the internet, something maybe that you're reminded from your devotions, a good trigger, a good thought impulse, something that maybe feels like juicy gossip, something that, you know, fill it in. It could be, a, a, as the Bible talks about, a fiery dart directly from the enemy. Our spiritual enemy may have the opportunity to inject a, a thought or perception. Well, we need to, right then, at step one, take that thought captive in obedience to Christ and decide, is this true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent, and praiseworthy? If so, dwell on it, because those thoughts will influence your attitude, and the Lord knows our attitudes. It will affect our motives, right? We can do a lot of nice things, but if we do it for the wrong reason or the wrong motive, it's, it's not really sanctified. And those, those things that we dwell on affect, like we just read in Romans 8, 6, it, it affects what we say and what we do. And if we're in a cycle where we're constantly filtering those thoughts, dwelling on what is correct, then we will develop proper attitudes and motivation. We'll say the right things and we'll do the right things. And that will be sort of a reinforcing cycle. But if we let those thoughts come in that are wrong and we dwell on those, we'll end up saying the wrong stuff and doing the wrong stuff. And that will further reinforce negative thought cycles, right? So I've, I beat this pretty hard, but I think it's really important to understand that it, it begins in our hearts and in our minds, and that influences what we do and what we say. I uh, really appreciate Pastor Chuck Swindoll. Uh, he's got a lot of wisdom and, and he, he has a, a good quote on this topic. He says, we have a choice every day regarding the attitude that we embrace for the day. Life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. Our attitude is everything. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts, more important than the past, than education, than money, circumstances, failures, successes, what other people think or say or do about us. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It'll make a break a company, a family, a church, or a home. Attitude's important. And we get to choose what our attitude is. We get to choose what we dwell on in our minds. And we can choose to obey what we just talked about, and all the things we're about to talk about. Obedience isn't toyed with by the Lord. In John 14, 15, 
He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, that's, that's sobering, right? Because all of us fail to do that periodically, daily, more often than we want to admit, probably. Jesus says, if you love me, if you're one of his disciples, you'll keep his commandments. And in Luke 6.46, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Ah, that's tough. That's how the Lord views obedience. It, is, it isn't a casual thing. We have to be careful that we don't uh, take a, um, a mindset of grace abusing, right? Well, the, the Lord's covered my sins. He's paid for them. We know that. We know that the Lord has paid for all of our sins if we're truly in his uh, household, right? If we're saved, born again, whatever phrase you choose to insert there for a genuine disciple but yet he he tells us to obey and in first samuel 16 7 we see that the lord isn't just interested in outward obedience like doing the right thing when people are watching he says but the lord said to samuel don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature because i've rejected him he was specifically talking here about selecting uh, one of the sons to be the next king. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart, right? He knows what we think. He understands our motivations and our attitudes better than we do. So we need to be careful not to obey outwardly only, but actually inwardly, right? Right? Chuck also, Chuck, like we hang out a lot, <laughs> Pastor Chuck Swindoll, <laughs> also said on this topic, our greatest struggle is not understanding the will of God, it's obeying the will whose God it is. Our problem isn't that we don't know, our problem is that we do know, but we aren't willing to follow through. <sighs> you know, if uh, our walk or our life in Christ, our process of sanctification or becoming more holy or more like Christ is described as a walk many times uh, in the scripture. And if you're walking and, and, and that path is described as a narrow path. Well, if you're walking a narrow path, if you've, if you've hiked where there's a, a pretty healthy cliff on one side, you know you better pay attention. You better you know, pay close attention to where you're putting every single step. In our spiritual lives, the same thing goes, right? That's taking those thoughts captive in obedience to Christ. It starts right there because if we don't, we'll veer off that narrow path and wander off into some region of sin that we got no business being in, right? So we have to pay attention um, how to walk in accordance with the Spirit's leading. And in order to understand how the Spirit would lead us, we need to understand the word that the Spirit inspired. And in order to understand what it says, turns out you have to listen to it and read it. Who knew? That doesn't come easily because it takes time and effort and focus. You've probably heard this verse before, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth. The New American Standard says, accurately handling the word of truth. In order to accurately understand this and apply it and even explain it to folks, you have to put in some time and effort. It turns out you can't like put this under your pillow and suck it up into your head through like osmosis. Doesn't work that way. Um, you, and Pastor Paul kind of warns us about the notion of speed reading the Bible, right? And, and it's fine to read it quickly, say, oh, I finished 83 chapters today. Well, okay, th that's interesting. But how much of it did you actually pack in your mind and heart, right? And so meditating on the word, praying through the word, reading uh, solid commentaries, reading uh, biblical books by solid authors, all of that stuff goes together, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen by accident. 
Another aspect, uh, so I'm going through several aspects of our lives uh, that help us learn to obey that very first command, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. So, so uh, controlling our thought lives is part of that. Reading the word is obviously part of that. And Pastor Paul's been going through a series on prayer. Um, some have defined prayer as unhurried conversation with God. So we, we have to... We have to move well past the point of memorized go-to prayers, right? Um, you, may, you may pop one off before a meal or before bed or whatever, but the notion of unhurried conversation with God, um, developing that sort of deep relationship with him, that, that's a whole different level of prayer that, that we need to uh, get to, and, and I, I won't dwell on it long since... Paul's just covered that in, in detail. But uh, there, are some, there are some elements of prayer uh, that, I, that I will mention quickly. And, and I think an important one, uh, which Paul mentioned, is, for, is captured in Psalm 66, verse 18. If I cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. This doesn't mean if I occasionally sin... Uh, God gives me the holy Heisman, right? It, that, that's not that he won't pay attention at all uh, because we all occasionally sin. Um, cherishing iniquity in my heart. So you can be an authentic believer and yet have parts of your life dominated by some kind of sin, um, a besetting sin that has a grasp on you. And for whatever reason, you're not repenting right repenting actually means to stop and turn and go the other way not just feel bad about it because you got caught right that's I, I don't know that's perhaps feelings of guilt and feelings of guilt when we realize we've sinned are not necessarily inappropriate but uh, we know that um, when we repent ask God to forgive us and stop doing that behavior we have no guilt uh, the Lord has uh, taken that uh, and he's paid that penalty. But the whole point is that confession and repentance are key to having a vibrant prayer life. So our adoration, praising the Lord, and thanksgiving. So some have used the acronym, the ACTS of Prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. I kind of prefer the CATS of Prayer, even though I don't really like cats and, and I'm allergic to them. But... <laughs> Um, I think it's important that, uh, that we include confession early in our prayer because if we are not confessing, it says the Lord won't hear if we cherish iniquity in our heart. So what order you do them in isn't all that important, but there are aspects, adoration and thanksgiving. Turns out if you search your Bible for the, fra the phrase, praise the Lord, it turns out it, it's in there a few times. Uh, we're supposed to do that, right? He is the one. Uh, who is ultimately worthy of all glory and honor and praise, right? And so we are to give him that adoration and thanksgiving. And finally, uh, supplication or asking for things. And Paul uh, talked extensively about that. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. We, we must be careful not to twist that into some kind of Name it and claim it mindset, right? Um, delighting ourselves in the Lord really entails aligning our will with his will. And then when we pray something that's according to his will, of course he'll grant it in his way and in his time. So remember, when you bring those supplications or you, you address some uh, concern, not worry, because that'd be sinful, so we use the word concern. If, you, if you're presenting some concern to the Lord, remember, don't go back and, and pick it up. You can pray about it again, for sure, uh, but you've left that with the Lord. And then we have to exercise the fruit of the Holy Spirit of patience, right? Because God's timing isn't always what we think he ought to be doing, right? But his plan is perfect. So God gives us great promises concerning prayer. 
but he does expect humility and thanksgiving and obedience. Another aspect of uh, how we will demonstrate our love for God with all our heart and soul and mind is through worship. So worship is um, not just singing together. John uh, 4 verses 23 and 24 give us some insight into what, what Jesus thought about worship. The hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So uh, we, we need to understand that our mind and will and our emotions are all factors in our worship of God but we need to make sure we're worshiping him in the right way, in truth, in alignment with what his word tells us, right? That's the truth. He, he prescribes to us how we are to worship. Uh, you can do exhaustive studies on the topic. So in addition to anxiety being a prevalent problem in the church in America, there are also some congregations that worship in non-biblical ways. And thankfully, that's not the case here. It's, it's done uh, carefully and with great consideration to the songs and the prayers and the preaching. But even what we do here, churchy stuff, singing songs and clapping and raising hands, which is all great, is not really the full extent of what we are called to do in worship. Warren Wiersbe says, worship is the submission of all of our nature to God, the quickening of our conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of our mind with his truth, the purifying of our imagination by his beauty, the opening of our heart to his love, the surrender of our will to his purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable and therefore, the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin. And this is worship in its largest sense, petition as well as praise, preaching as well as prayer, hearing as well as speaking, action as well as words, obeying as well as offering, loving people as well as loving God. However, the primary acts of worship are those that focus directly on God. And we must not imagine that working for God in the world is a substitute for direct fellowship with him in praise and prayer and devotion. That's from J.I. Packer. So worship in its large sense, including what we do here corporately, uh, is a key aspect of demonstrating our love for God. So those are some of the ways that we can show our obedience to that first part of the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. The next aspect actually demonstrates obedience to both God and the second part, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's kind of wrapped up in the concept of service. Romans 12.1 has some insights on service. The author through the Holy Spirit says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, or in the New American Standard, your spiritual service of worship, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, living with a sacrificial mindset, choosing to serve. We all get the same number of minutes a week. We, we don't all get the same, num same number of years or days in our lives, right? That's, that's up to the Father. But each week we get the same amount of time, and we decide how we spend it. And there, in this society, are so many distractions that can gobble up our time. How many streaming services exist now that didn't exist, I don't know, 25 years ago or whatever. I don't know the answer. At least four. That's safe. <laughs> we have uh, smartphones. 
don't know if they make us smarter necessarily, but that's their nickname. They can gobble up astounding amounts of time. All sorts of activities are worthy of some fraction of our time. We need to be careful, and I guess we could even say not only take thoughts captive obedience to Christ, but take our use of time captive in obedience to Christ. So we need to decide what to do with those hours, right? We need to, I promise, if you, if you say, I'll do some of that prayer and reading and maybe some of that serving stuff, when I, get, when I find some extra time, you won't. You won't find it. it. Like, look under your couch cushions. You may find some random popcorn and coins, but there's no like, oh, I found an hour. It's not going to happen, right? We have to decide that stuff up front. So it's not just how we des- decide to use our time with regard to our spiritual service of worship as a living sacrifice. The Lord gives us time. He gives us talents also, right? He's given each of us uniquely specific gifts and abilities. Thank God we're not all the same. If, if we were all strange engineers like me, that'd be a scary world. But he has is, he is put us together as a family, as different, the, the scripture uses the, the, the picture of body parts, if you will. You, maybe you, could, you think you can do without a pinky until you try to use a wrench or something, and you go, wow, I, I really need that. And, and we're, we're each part of the body. And God has knit us together specifically so that collectively we can serve his purposes, right? He's also given each of us a measure of wealth. Uh, the Lord says in, in the word that God gives us the ability to, to create wealth. And just like time, uh, we get different amounts of that. He, he sprinkles that around differently. We have to remember it's all his stuff. Right? Everything in the universe is God's. He just loans us some of his stuff while we're here. But he tells us how we are to manage or be a steward of that stuff that he's given us while we're here. It's pretty clear in here. Again, you can learn all about that in the word. And he expects us to obey in that area of time management, talent management, and treasure management that'll be a a a whole different study but the concept of service is key philippians chapter 2 verses 3 through 5 talk about attitudes regarding service do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves Let each of you not only look to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The NASB says, have this mindset as Christ did. Jesus had, of of anyone, had the most selfless mindset, right? I mean, he sacrificed himself for his people. We are to consider others as more important than ourselves. That's, that seems pretty against our culture. <laughs> we live in a me, now uh, culture. And yet, kind of like that whole thing about don't worry, the word tells us to consider others as more important than ourselves. And again, it goes back to that whole uh, collective unity uh, the, the picture of the body, the picture of, uh, that the word gives that were stones put together to make a building, each supporting one another. Um, that whole idea of service with humility is key. Galatians 5.13 says that we are to serve one another in love. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says that we are to encourage one another and build one another up. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says we are to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, encouraging one another. 
I know a lot of you uh, know and love Philippians, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. We're going to look at them again uh, with this idea uh, in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I think we all understand we're not saved by our works, right? That we're saved by grace through faith, and that faith is a gift from God. But we are saved for good works. God has laid out before each one of us a path that he has us to walk. And included in that path, in that life, are a series of good works that he wants us to do. He has enabled us to do them. He doesn't tell us to do stuff that we can't do because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That doesn't mean that you can, like, fly unaided, right? Let's not get crazy about it. But the Lord has given us gifts and abilities to do these good works. In James chapter 2, verse 17, another verse that hits the importance of not only faith, but works. It's also faith by itself. If it does not have works, is dead. You can, there's a lot of professing Christians that say they're saved, but they don't do any of the things we're talking about. We're not saved by those good works, but we are saved in order to do them. And Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 14 through 16, help us to understand, well, why are we to do them? You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So those works that the Lord has set out before us in our path of life are to be accomplished so that he is glorified. It's not so we can get a pat on the back or, you know, a, a gold sticker on our calendar or, or whatever reward we might be looking for. That reward will come in heaven as, as decreed by the Lord. It's something we get for eternity. That's a reward, right? But we are to walk in those good deeds that he set before us. And those good deeds are meant to glorify God. The, the last part of this whole walking uh, and showing love for our, uh, our neighbors, uh, I'm going to talk about the concept of fellowship. So you, you may have heard the phrase or the, the Greek word koinonia for fellowship. It's different than straight up friendship um, in order we can't we cannot have biblical fellowship unless we're a believer we're a disciple of Christ that that fellowship has to be established first vertically with God and then we can share biblical fellowship horizontally with other believers we have to know uh, the reality of fellowship with God before we can have fellowship with others in that common relationship with God. God has fashioned us uh, for fellowship. He calls us to belong, not just to believe. There are lots of folks uh, in this country and elsewhere who, who maybe they say they're Christians, maybe they are believers, but they, they don't have fellowship. They they ignore coming to church. You've no doubt read Hebrews chapter 10 talks a good bit about telling us to, uh, to, to come together, to mutually encourage, to, to worship together. We, we're commanded to do that. We are to be committed not only to the Lord, but to his family. John 13, 34, and 35 tell us a key ingredient for that fellowship and how others will know that we're really part of God's family. 
A new commandment, I, so this is the Lord Jesus speaking, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. We're blessed to be here as part of this congregation. Um, my wife and I have had the opportunity, I'll say, to, to move around in the country a lot. 15 moves in, in the military and we show up here in the thriving metropolis of Marlette <laughs> some years later. But we have experienced the love of God as poured out through this congregation as we have enjoyed that at, at other parts of the country. Um, and it's a real blessing. This fellowship that we enjoy as believers is more than friendship. We we tend in church in the United States to use fellowship as a christian ease pseudonym for, it really means hanging out and eating. That's, <laughs> but, but it's not really what it means. Um, our, our kids might say fellowship is playing video games and snacking on uh, who knows what. <laughs> but, but it's beyond that, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 talks about sacrificing for others in fellowship. Philippians 1.7 talks about sharing in their troubles. Philippians 3.10 talks about sharing in the fellowship of Christ's suffering. We know that there are brothers and sisters around the planet who are suffering for their faith. We've, Like I said before, we've got it pretty good here in America as far as being Christians. But that kind of fellowship that we're talking about requires effort. It takes work and it requires taking some emotional risk. The enemy, our spiritual enemy, wants to break our fellowship. He wants to destroy the unity among believers. But we are charged by scripture to ensure that unity is sustained and restored when it is strained, right? If it is strained, we need to pray about it. We need to take the initiative to restore it. We need to sympathize with the other person. We need to confess whatever our part of the conflict is. We need to be humble. We need to remember not attack the person, but attack the issue. And above all, even if we can't resolve the issue, we need to restore the relationship. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15 is a key component of restoring relationships. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your, your Father forgive your trespasses. Yikes. So it sounds to me like perhaps we're not supposed to hold grudges. That's kind of what I gleaned from that. And that all goes back to that, what are we dwelling on? Are we dwelling on when that person hosts me? You don't understand what they did to me. Nah, get over it. Give it to the Lord, pray for that person, and move on. Because that's a scary warning there. We need to forgive others. We need to love others. We need to choose to forgive and encourage and not criticize. We need to refuse to listen to gossip. Remember when Jesus was asked, well, who's my neighbor when, when he said this? And, they, and he told them the story of the Good Samaritan. And the Samaritans and Jews hated each other. So our love is not to be just limited to Christian friends, but even those outside the church. Pastor Paul says, love the face off the community, right? We're even to pray for our persecutors. Well, let's face it, not everybody's easy to love all the time. I know I'm not. Don't say Amen. So we need to choose to ask God to give us the fruit of the Spirit, all of them, uh, so that we can obey all of these things. Trying to summarize this back up, we started out with, in case you forgot, because I had 48 scriptures between now and then, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And some aspects of how we can can do that are taking control of our thought life, studying the word, praying and worshiping. And the second part of Jesus' answer, love your neighbor as yourself, 
And we can do partly that through service and through fellowship. Let's uh, close our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, I pray that you would knit it into our hearts and minds and take away any foolishness that I added. Illuminate us, Lord, that we can not just understand this, but put it into practice. We ask that you would fill us with the fruit of your Holy Spirit that we need so desperately. Give us grace and strength and perseverance to live this out so that you would be glorified and we would be sanctified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a golden day in this beautiful weather.